1985, Lord Christopher Monckton started working on a puzzle. A puzzle that ended up being one of the most difficult puzzles ever devised. He spent the next 14 years of his life working on it. He called it the Eternity Puzzle. Why did you invent a puzzle that might take an eternity to solve? I wanted to give the world a challenge, and I wanted to get rich doing it. <laughs> but he wasn't just a puzzle maker, he was also a clever marketer. See, he offered a million pound prize for anyone who could solve it. Has offered a prize of a million pounds. And you will win one million pounds. The largest payout in toy history. And at the time, prize money games were very popular. Who Wants to Be a Millionaire's board game was a bestseller, and game shows had been peaking in popularity. And this game found a way to bring the promise of riches to the masses. And it worked. It became the best-selling puzzle game of all time, selling over 500,000 copies. The puzzle seems simple enough. 209 green plastic pieces, each comprised of triangles arranged in random formations. It was a packing puzzle. You had to arrange those 209 pieces to fit perfectly into the dodecahedronal board. Only, there was no picture on the faces of the pieces to guide you. Since the pieces were all made of simple triangles, you never know if two pieces that fit together belong together until you reach the last piece. But this puzzle wasn't just difficult. From the start, Lord Monckton designed the puzzle to be impossible. To make sure it was impossible, he wrote a program to try to solve it. Since he knew his program wouldn't be the most efficient, he made the puzzle bigger and bigger until it would take hundreds of millions of billions of years to solve. After he ran simulations to solve smaller versions of the puzzle, he made the assumption that simply making the puzzle bigger would make it harder to solve. And this was true, to a point. But after the puzzle reaches about 70 pieces, the opposite turned out to be true. As the puzzle grows larger, the number of possible solutions also grows larger, exponentially actually, and the ratio of solutions to non-solutions tipped against his favor. But despite that flaw, the puzzle was still virtually unsolvable. When a person tries to solve it, they typically get stuck after placing around 150 pieces. But Lord Monckton didn't account for mathematicians trying to solve it. In fact, he actually thought it was impossible for mathematics to help solve it at all. It won't be a computer who solves it, and it won't be a mathematician either, Lord Monckton said in a press release. But he was wrong on both accounts. Two Cambridge mathematicians, Alex Selby and Oliver Riordan, eventually solved the puzzle. Alex was given a copy of the puzzle for his birthday, and after seeing someone post a near solution on a mailing list, he was convinced it was actually possible to solve. And he recruited help from his former colleague, Oliver, who happened to be one of the top mathematicians in the world. But we already established that the brute force method wouldn't work, even running on a thousand supercomputers. So how could they approach solving this problem? Well, Alex was a computer programmer, and solving it without a computer never even crossed his mind. It was simply a matter of making a solving program efficient enough to overcome the millions of billions of year bottleneck you'd run into with the brute force method. To explain the first optimization they made, let's imagine you're loading luggage into the back of a car. What's the best approach to do that? Well, you take the most awkwardly shaped luggage and find a place to put it in first. And it just so happened that was the approach Alex and Oliver started with. But which pieces were the easiest to place? Well, it turns out you can't really tell at all just by looking at abstract green blobs. To answer that question, they turned to a computer using the brute force approach. But not with a full 209 pieces, but with a random subset of 24 pieces. By solving many versions of the puzzle, they found the pieces that were hardest to place. Every time a piece was part of a solvable grid, that piece's score went up. After repeating that process millions of times, they had accurate estimates for how easy each piece was to place. They found wavy pieces with lots of knobs hardest to place, and pieces with straight lines are the easiest. At the same time, they took note of which region shapes were easiest to fill and assigned them scores too, using the same method. Now armed with that knowledge, they could describe the probability of solving any given region of the puzzle with any given set of pieces. But that alone wasn't enough to solve the problem. At the same time, the creator of the puzzle, Lord Monckton, was releasing hints periodically for the puzzle, telling the world where specific pieces belong in his solution. 
by solving other puzzles released by his company, they would mail you the location of certain pieces and the official solution. But Alex and Oliver knew something most others failed to realize. These hints weren't actually any help at all. See, we already know there is an exponential number of solutions to this puzzle, and knowing where a few pieces might go is going to limit you more than it's going to help you. Let's say you were fishing in the Pacific Ocean, and someone told you the exact location of a single fish in the Atlantic. Well, that's not going to get anybody to leave the Pacific, especially if you think there are more total fish in the Pacific. The next innovation they made was to have their solver try to solve the hardest region of the puzzle first. The region of the puzzle most likely to have the fewest solutions meant they would fail faster on each iteration, thus speeding up the program significantly. But even with these optimizations, the puzzle would still be too slow to expect to find a solution. They needed to know a way to find when a solution wouldn't work ahead of time. So Alex and Oliver broke the puzzle into even smaller shapes. They looked at each 11 triangle grid and found every possible path you can make between two edges of it. They stored these results in tables, and now the program can determine instantly if those small shapes were fillable or not, adding another shortcut into the program. When Alex began this journey, he was unemployed, and he decided to take on this puzzle full time. And seven months after he began, he succeeded. His computer notified him of a solution. At first, he didn't believe it. And when he told Oliver, who was away on a weekend trip while the solution was found, he also didn't believe it. Alex spent the better part of a day verifying that the solution was real before it sunk in. For the first time since beginning the process, he took out the plastic puzzle his brother has gifted him, and he assembled the pieces into the cardboard frame. They had done it. They had a real solution. They were millionaires. They solved the most difficult puzzle ever devised. See, if you ask Alex, he says they got lucky. At least, they think they did. It's possible there are more solutions than they realized, or their solver was more efficient than they thought, but regardless, they did it. Lord Moncton had to sell his house in order to pay the prize money. And Oliver used that prize money to buy himself a new house. And Alex, well, he probably wasn't in a hurry to find a job after winning that much money. Thanks for watching. If you're interested in watching videos about weird games, please be sure to subscribe because I have made plenty and I will make plenty more. Thanks for watching. I'm Jake Frondorf and this is Cardboard Mountain.